My sermon passage is Luke 9, verses 28 to 35, or rather 28 to 36. Now about eight days after these sayings, he, Jesus, took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his countenance was altered, and his raiment became dazzling white. And behold, two men talked with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, and when they wakened, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is well that we are here. Let us make three booths, tents, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. And as he said this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And the voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my son, my chosen, listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silence, and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. <clears throat> Who is Jesus? Here we have the answer to the question asked by Herod and by Jesus himself. Jesus, Jesus was on a roll. So let's go to the first of this chapter and see how we get to this mountaintop experience of transfiguration and the answer to the questions about Jesus' identity. Luke 9, 1. And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal. And he said to them, Take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. And whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Now Herod, the Tetrarch, a governor, heard of all that was done, and he was perplexed because it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead, by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the old prophets had risen. Herod said, John, I beheaded. But who is this about whom I hear such things? And he sought to see him. Who is this? He wondered. Who is this Jesus? A few verses later, Jesus is asking the questions. Verse 18, Now it happened that as Jesus was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he asked them, Who do the people say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and others that one of the old prophets has risen. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, The Christ of God. Now if there was any doubt, and it seemed like there was always doubt upon the mountain, God weighed in. A cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. That's who Jesus is. Let us pray. By your Spirit, O God, enlighten our hearts, open our minds, fill our vision with your radiance, and give us life as we hear your word today. Amen. Jesus' closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, needed a glimpse of glory, and they got one on that mountain. Maybe you do too now. The pandemic pale horse of death wasn't enough. Now comes the red horse of war and bloodshed. And the world is too small for it. I know someone from Ukraine. Maybe you do too. I know people who've lived and worked in Moscow. Maybe you do too. And if you don't, images and sounds of the terror of war over there is as close as right here. This is a smartphone war. 
smartphones with Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and all the rest for propaganda and for information. Live cameras showing the freshly dead. I watched some. I couldn't watch much. But I'm torn. I don't need glimpses of evil, dead or alive. I need glimpses of glory. And you can see them too. Glimpses of glory. The glory of courage on the part of the Ukrainian President Zelensky and the Ukrainian people, who, by the way, are showing us what it actually means to have an organized militia. God bless them. Glimpses of glory. Glimpses of dignity. Glimpses of honor worthy of praise. As awful as war is, I needed to see something like that. Dignified, honorable resistance of evil after all this country has gone through lately, with undignified, dishonorable, inglorious fear and loathing of one another. Peter, James, and John needed a glimpse of glory after hearing what Jesus was saying. Notice our passage starts out now about eight days after these sayings. Then Jesus took them with him up on the mountain to pray. Here's what he told them. And it was in response to Peter's declaration and confession that Jesus is the Christ of God. Jesus said then, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Jesus, the Christ, must be debased, he said, must suffer, must be rejected, must be killed. The disciples needed a glimpse of glory. And if that wasn't bad enough, Jesus went on. And he said to all, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake, he will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words... Of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Peter, James, and John must have been rattled. And eight days later, they must have been exhausted from anxiety, maybe disappointment that Jesus wasn't the kind of a Messiah and Savior they were expecting. They got their hopes up. It was the festival of booths or tents the time when the people of God celebrated how God protected them during their wandering in the wilderness between Egypt and the Promised Land. Surely the Messiah would deliver them from Rome. But no, Jesus said he had to be killed, and his followers better be ready to lose their lives for his sake. No wonder Jesus took them with him up a mountain to pray. No wonder they were, quote, heavy with sleep, they needed a glimpse of glory, and they woke up to one, to a vision that reminded them of who they were and whose they were together. They were the same people God had guided and protected during the wandering. There was Moses, their leader and savior then. There was Elijah, a great prophet. And there was Jesus, all of them in all their glory, dignity, honor, worthy of praise. Peter was so rattled, it says he didn't realize what he was saying. He wanted to set up boots, uh, boots for him. You know, the small tabernacles or tents they used during the festival. And stay a while. In an instant, it says, came another reminder of who they were, whose they were, and that God was protecting them. First, remember something from Exodus 13. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. It was daytime on that mountain with Peter, James, and John, and Moses, Elijah, and Jesus, and God. As Peter was prattling about setting up three tents, it says, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A cloud of God? The glory of God? I'll bet they were afraid. But their God was, close enough to protect them, and close enough to hear. 
and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. That should remind you of another time when Jesus was, uh, another time with Jesus when God was close enough to be heard. Jesus' baptism. From Luke chapter 3. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form as a dove, and a voice came from heaven, Thou art my beloved Son, with thee I am well pleased. I love the closeness of God in the baptism story and in the transfiguration story. And Jesus taught that God is spirit, that those who worship God must worship in spirit and in truth. But in Jesus' time, before science, the sky was the limit, the heavens were just up there out of reach, and God was just right there. People went up mountains to be closer to God. Jesus took his closest disciples after he broke their hearts and scared them up on a mountain to be closer to God. And it's no wonder that God would show up so overtly and audibly on this mountain with Peter, James, John, and Jesus. Notice Moses and Elijah had gone back to where they came from. It's no wonder that God would show up so overtly and audibly on the mountain because Jesus was about to suffer and his disciples were too. God is never closer than when we are suffering or when we are deliberately standing with, or crouching and hiding with, or hugging and praying with, or helping someone who is suffering. That's when we realize that God is close. Their dreams of a political messiah dashed. Their hopes for deliverance, again, this time from Rome, quashed. Their very faith in God rattled. Peter, James, and John needed a holy intervention, and they got it not just in the pyrotechnics of the transfiguration of Christ, and not just in the vision, and not just in hearing the voice of God so close. By the way, notice the difference in the baptism scene and the mountaintop experience. At Jesus' baptism, God speaks to Jesus. At the transfiguration, God speaks to the disciples and gives an order. Listen to Jesus. They got a glimpse of God's glory, not just in those experiences, but in the reminder of who they were and whose they were together. Because God's glory is a glory that is shared. As theologian Claudio Carval, I can't say his name, Carvalis, a Presbyterian teaching elder, puts it, God's glory is a glory that is shared. A glory that is shared, that illuminates each other that strengthens each other's lives and gives meaning to the past and future events. Jesus' transfiguration transfigured Peter, James, and John in that it transformed them into ambassadors for the Jesus way to carry on his teachings after his departure to come. Brother Claudio explains, one of the lessons of this text is that the glory of God is only possible if lived together in community, nobody not even Jesus, could shine alone. Only when we are together can God's radiance light each other's lives. Also, we can only make sense of ourselves if the people who came before us are present in our struggle. For Peter, James, and John, that was Moses and Elijah. For us, I guess it's all of them, Moses and Elijah, and the testimony and legacy and maybe the spirits of Peter, James, and John and the rest of the great cloud of witnesses. Brother Claudio goes on. Our ancestors came to us to give us a thick sense of the present and to say that they survived under the name of God, and we can do that too. Glory is only possible if shared, and that means that we are to share the light of Christ to the world, especially those placed in the shadows of our society. Brother Claudio does something with the idea of those shadows and that cloud on the mountain that makes the transfiguration so much more than one of those wild miracle Bible stories. He is a theologian, so let's listen to him theologize. The shadow that they disappear into, he says, carries the voice of God affirming Jesus. In that way, when we light the lives of those placed in the shadows of society, we must know that it is from those shadows, from those clouds, that the voice of God appears affirming Jesus. Wow. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, it says, 
and the disciples kept silence. We too should be left speechless at this mystery. Brother Claudio says we keep in silence trying to figure out the transfigured Jesus knowing that we are part of this transfiguration and that means God will refigure our lives, our thinking, our actions, our path. When we meet the transfigured Jesus we are disfigured, transfigured, and refigured. God is still speaking and if we're quiet enough remembering who we are together and whose we are together, then we can hear better together. And we'll be better prepared for our own vision of where to go and what to do. It's in those shadows too, with the suffering, that we can get glimpses of glory and hear the voice of God say, These are my children, my chosen. Listen. Amen.